Hello everyone. Information Box Ticket Lifestyles brings you today environmental microbiology topic on bioremediation. But first, don't forget to give a like to this video, subscribe to my channel and press the bell icon button. Let's begin with the table of content. First, we will have a brief introduction about bioremediation, objectives, principle, categories, types of bioremediation methods, methods, applications, advantages, and lastly, limitations and concerns of bioremediation. Let's begin with a brief introduction about bioremediation. In order to clean up a contaminated location, bioremediation refers to the utilization of microorganisms that are either naturally existing or intentionally introduced. It is a method for detoxifying pollutants in soil and other settings that primarily makes use of microbes but also plants and microbial or plant enzymes. Biodegradation, which is the term for a partial and occasionally complete transformation or detoxification of pollutants by microbes and plants, is an element of the notion. By adding nutrients, carbon sources, or electron donors to the native microorganisms, bacteria or fungus, biostimulation, biorestoration, or by adding an enriched culture of microorganisms that have a particular properties that allow them to degrade the desired contaminant at a faster rate, bioaugmentation, the process of bioremediation increases the rate of the natural microbial degradation of contaminants. Let's learn the objective of bioremediation. In order to comply with regulatory agency restrictions, bioremediation must at the very least lower pollutant levels to undetectable, harmless or acceptable levels. Ideally, organopollutants should be entirely mineralized to carbon dioxide. Let's head to the principle of bioremediation. In order to do bioremediation, it is necessary to promote the development of certain bacteria that eat and produce energy from pollutants like oil, solvents and pesticides. These microorganisms devour the pollutants and break them down into innocuous gases like carbon dioxide and tiny quantities of water. In order for bioremediation to be effective, the correct temperature, nutrition and food must be present. Otherwise, the removal of toxins may take longer. If the environment is unsuitable for bioremediation, it can be made more suitable by introducing amendments such as molasses, vegetable oil or even just air. These modifications produce the ideal environment for microorganisms to thrive and finish the bioremediation process. The bioremediation procedure might take a few months to many years. The amount of time needed varies depending on factors including the size of polluted region, the amount of pollutants present, environmental factors like soil density and temperature, and whether bioremediation will occur in in situ or ex situ. Thank you so much for making me reach the 500 subscriber goal. Kindly keep showing your support by subscribing. Let's learn the categories of bioremediation. Two categories of biological remediation exist. Microbial remediation. The capacity of microorganisms to degrade a wide variety of organic molecules and absorb inorganic chemicals is well documented. At the moment, Bioremediation procedures include the employment of bacteria to clean up pollutants. Toxic and other pollutants can be removed from the environment using a variety of microbial systems including bacteria, fungus, yeast and actinomycetes. Microorganisms are abundant, easily described, incredibly diversified, all pervasive and capable of using a wide range of toxic substances as a source of nutrition. They may be used in both in situ and ex situ settings and can also clean up in a variety of harsh environmental situations. Even though a variety of microorganisms may break down crude oil found in soil, it has been shown that using a mixed culture method rather than poor cultures in bioremediation is more advantageous since it demonstrates the synergistic interactions. For the removal of petroleum hydrocarbon pollutants from soil, 
several bacteria can be utilized. Pseudomonas, Aeromonas, Moraxella, Bajenrinchia, Flavobacteria, Chromobacteria, Nocardia, Cornibacteria, Acinobacter, Mycobacteria, Modococci, Streptomyces, Bacilli, Erythrobacter, and Cyanobacteria are among the bacteria that may break down significant pollutants. Next category is Phytoremediation. A bioremediation technique called phytoremediation employs diverse plant species to transport, stabilize, and or eliminate pollutants in soil and groundwater. The mechanisms of phytoremediation come in many different forms. Number 1. Rhizosphere Biodegradation In this process, the plant releases organic compounds through its roots, feeding soil microbes with nutrition. The microbes accelerate biological decay. Number 2. Phytostabilization Instead of degrading impurities throughout this process, the plant's chemical byproduct immobilizes them. Number 3. Phytoaccumulation, also called as phytoextraction. The pollutants are absorbed by plant roots during this process along with other nutrients and water. The contaminated mass is not removed, instead it becomes a part of the plants, leaves and branches. This technique is mostly used in metal containing trash. Number 4. Hydroponic systems for treating water streams, rhizofiltration. In contrast to phytoaccumulation, rhizofiltration employs plants that are grown in greenhouses with their roots submerged in water. Ex situ, groundwater remediation may be done using this technique. In order to irrigate these plants, groundwater is pumped to the surface. An artificial soil media like sand blended with preltile or vermiculate is typically used in hydroponic systems. The roots are removed and discarded as soon as they are completely saturated with pollutants. Number 5. Phytovoltilization in this procedure, plants absorb contaminated water that contains organic substances and then expel those substances into the atmosphere through their leaves. Number 6. Phytodegradation Plants really metabolize and eliminate pollutants inside the plant tissues during this process. And lastly, number 7. Hydraulic control By restricting the circulation of groundwater during this process, trees indirectly remediate. When a tree's root descend below the water table and form a massive root mass that absorbs a lot of water, they operate as natural pumps. A cottonwood tree may absorb up to 350 gallons of water per day, whereas a poplar tree can extract 30 gallons of water from the ground each day. Don't forget to subscribe to this channel so you don't miss any of my videos. Types of Bioremediation Methods Natural attenuation or Intrinsic Bioremediation It means without outside intervention, bioremediation happens naturally. Biostimulation To boost the bioavailability within the medium, fertilizers are added to encourage bioremediation. Technologies can be generally classified as in situ or ex situ. In in situ bioremediation, it entails cleaning up the site's contamination. And in ex situ bioremediation, it entails taking the contaminated material somewhere else to be treated. Few examples of bioremediation related technologies include the following Number 1 Phytoremediation, Number 2 Bioventing, Number 3 Bioleaching, Number 4 land farming number five bioreactor number six composting number seven bioaugmentation number eight rhizofiltration and number nine biostimulation let's head to the applications of bioremediation metals radionuclides pesticides explosives fuels volatile organic compounds and semi-volatile Organic compounds can all be remediated with the help of bioremediation. Percolate 
a pollutant that has been demonstrated to be resistant in surface and groundwater systems is being remediated and research is being done to understand the function of phytoremediation in this process. It might be used to remove pollutants from soil and groundwater. Chelating agents are occasionally employed to render radioactive pollutants suitable for plant take-up. Next is Advantages of Bioremediation In comparison to other cleanup techniques, bioremediation provides a variety of benefits. It is a comparatively green approach that harms ecosystems less because it simply employs natural processes. Since amendments and bacteria may be injected underground to clean up toxins in groundwater and soil, it frequently takes place underground and hence does not impact adjacent populations. Due to the fact that toxins and pollutants are transformed into water and safe gases like carbon dioxide throughout the bioremediation process, there aren't many dangerous byproducts produced. Because it requires less labor and equipment than other cleanup techniques, bioremediation is more affordable. The precise bacteria required to break down the contaminants are encouraged by choosing the limiting element needed to stimulate their development and bioremediation may be adjusted to the demands of the contaminated location in question. Lastly, limitations and concerns of bioremediation. It is not always possible to predict the toxicity and bioavailability of biodegradation products. Byproducts of degradation may be bioaccumulated in animals or mobilized in groundwater. To make sure that plant products do not introduce dangerous or harmful substances into the food chain, further study is required to establish the destiny of different molecules in the metabolic cycle of plants. When leaves fall in the autumn or when firewood or mulch made from trees is used, scientists need to determine whether Pollutants that accumulate in leaves and wood of trees are discharged. If harvested plants have large quantities of heavy metals, disposal may be problematic. Treatment is restricted by the depth of pollutants. Generally speaking, it only occurs in shallow soils, stream, and groundwater. Typically, shallow soil, stream, and groundwater pollutions, as well as locations with lower pollutant concentrations, are the only places where phytoremediation is used. Depending on the environment, phytoremediation may be seasonal success. Its efficiency will also be impacted by other meteorological circumstances. The establishment of chosen plant community is essential for cleanup to be successful. The introduction of new plant species may be far-reaching ecological effects. It has to be observed and examined beforehand. Plants may perish if pollutants concentration are too high. Some phytoremediation moves pollution from one medium to another like soil to air. For heavily absorbed pollutants like polychlorinated biphenyl, phytoremediation is ineffective. And lastly, a sizable amount of land surface is needed for phytoremediation. So that's it for today. Thank you so much for watching till the end. Don't forget to like this video, subscribe to my channel and press the bell icon button. Thank you so much for supporting till the end.